Subject matter, again I say, it is a teaching session. I'm going to give you many scriptures, and I feel it's necessary to put it out there, because in, like I said in the opening, in my 25 years in the ministry, I have encountered people who have been confused about this topic. The devil would get into their mind and torment them. I have encountered people who were in false doctrine as a result of misunderstanding this topic. And it's one that needs to be clarified according to the Word of God. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Word is our standard. The Word is our spiritual foundation. The Word is our life, our everlasting life. The topic today is temptation and sin. Is there a difference? Now the Word of God teaches there is a difference between temptation and sin. Unfortunately, many people down through the years have confused the two subjects. They would classify temptation and sin together. The devil over the years, he has worked on people's minds directly. He has also used ministers of deceit in the pulpit, preaching false doctrines. And the devil, well, he'd work on people, telling them, well, you had a desire. You had a bad thought come to your mind, so you might as well act upon it, because you're already guilty before God. But that is deceit. That is a lie of the devil. And throughout this sermon, I'm going to prove that to you. Jesus said, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And he will do anything, he will say anything. To seek to get a person to fail God. People, by confusing temptation with sin, many believe they're unable to live free from sin, that it is impossible to live free from sin because they reason everybody's tempted. And if temptation is sin, no one can live free from sin. But the Word of God teaches plainly that a child of God can and is supposed to live free from sin and that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Also, the Word of God promises, take note, the Word of God promises that in this world, you will be tempted. You will be tempted in some form or fashion, and later in this sermon, I will give you scripture where the Lord promises temptations to come your way. However, first, to start out, let's examine the definition from the dictionary of sin and temptation. The two definitions clearly indicate there is a difference. First, the definition of sin, an offense against religious or moral law, a transgression of the law of God. The definition of temptation, to entice to do wrong by promise of pleasure or gain. Another definition, a test or a trial. The first definition of sin is someone doing or saying something that transgresses the law of God. The definition of temptation is a test or trial. And by that test or trial, by that temptation, that will determine whether a person sins or not. To break it down even further, when a thought or a desire to do wrong enters your mind, how do you respond when that thought or desire arises? Do you yield to that thought, that desire, and act upon it? Or do you turn from that temptation and turn to God? Do you turn from that temptation and turn to the Word of God and the grace of God? Before we proceed further down this road, I want to give you certain examples in the Bible of committing sin without acting it out. 
For when a person opens their heart, and this is the key, their heart, to that which is wrong, God considers it sin, even though the person lacks the opportunity to act upon the temptation. But it's not enough to just enter the mind. That temptation must enter the mind and drop into the heart for there to be sin. Consider the example Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount of adultery of the heart. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her in his heart. In his heart. In the heart. Here Jesus is saying, if a married person looks upon someone with a desire, if that person opens their heart and embraces that temptation that came to their mind. Meaning, if the person would act and, and commit adultery, if given the opportunity, Jesus is saying they've already committed it. Because all the person is lacking is the opportunity. However, if the person looks upon someone and a bad thought comes, or desire is stirred, if that person immediately turns from that temptation and closes their heart to it, knowing it is wrong before God, knowing they would never act upon such a thought or desire, and they turn to the Word of God and to the Holy Spirit for help to overcome, then there no sin of the heart has been committed. Another example that I've dealt with is anger. I remember years ago someone called me and they believed it is impossible to live free from sin. And this person was from the South, a part of a de denomination that is strong in the South that believes no one can live free from sin. And this person, their father, had been a pastor in this denomination for years. And every time he would preach upon the topic of it being impossible to live free from sin, he would always use the example of anger. And he would preach, everyone gets angry, therefore it is impossible to live free from sin. And I simply told the lady, the Word of God does not teach that. In fact, the scripture I gave her is the one I give to you in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. This scripture reveals there's a clear separation between anger and sin. Meaning, a person can get angry and not commit sin. For instance, an example. Do you think God considers it sin when a person get, gets angry at the devil and his works? No. Becoming angry is not sin. However, when that anger arises, how do you respond? How you respond will determine whether you sin or not. Everyone has gotten angry at some point. That part is true. Maybe an injustice happens in your life. Maybe something offensive or inappropriate is said to you or done to you. And suddenly, thoughts and emotions begin to stir within you. Now, the difference between a Jesus overcomer and someone who sins, what does, what do you do when that anger arises within? How do you respond? Remember, the scripture said, be angry and sin not. Do you open your heart and embrace that anger? Do you allow that anger to contaminate your soul and spirit? When that anger arises, do you respond to that anger by saying things you should never say? Or acting in ways you should never act? Or maybe, maybe you let that anger 
dwell in your mind. You let it reside within you. And you are not diligent to get rid of it. Instead, you let it fester and grow. Eventually, the anger produces a byproduct within you called bitterness, wrath, grudges, an unforgiving spirit. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus about these things. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Child of God, when anger arises within, it is your responsibility to immediately turn to the Holy Ghost who is to abide within you and bring self under subjection. Remember, in Galatians 5, it teaches nine fruits of the Spirit. Nine spiritual fruits that will be produced within you, three of which are divine love, temperance, which is self-control, and long-suffering, patience. These will help you first bring that anger under subjection, and then help you get rid of the anger before it turns into something worse. The Word of God teaches when anger comes, do not allow it to remain. That's scripture reading in Ephesians. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Get rid of it, especially before you go to bed at night. Because if anger remains within you while you sleep, it will contaminate the whole you, making it very difficult to be free of it in the future. Never let anger take root in your mind because sooner or later, it'll drop into your heart. And doing so, by letting it drop into your heart, you're giving place to the devil. And that always leads to sin. Turn from who or that which angers you and go to truth. Go to the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost for that fruit of love and temperance and long-suffering. Go to the Holy Ghost for forgiveness and comfort. As a child of God, always remember that the blood of Jesus has sealed your eternal soul. No person, no devil, can break the seal on your soul to contaminate your soul with sin. The seal of divine blood upon your soul is on the inside of your soul. And that's significant because that means with the seal on the inside, only by you committing willful sin will that seal be broken from within. In other words, you know something's a sin, you don't care, and you commit it anyway. Hebrews 10.26 For if we sin willfully... After that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. You know you have the knowledge of sin, but you do it anyway. You sin willfully. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Child of God, if you know something is a sin and you proceed to commit that sin, you have broken the seal of divine blood upon your soul. The sacrifice of divine blood shed at Calvary no longer works for you. And now you have opened yourself up to spiritual death. Again, I say the soul of a child of God is protected from external forces. The devil and his kingdom cannot make you sin. People cannot make you sin. The world cannot penetrate this seal upon your soul. However, the mind is not sealed by divine blood and protected like the soul. The mind is vulnerable to temptation from these external forces that I speak of. 
Think of the mind as a cup. And it is a child of God's responsibility to be the caretaker of your mind. To keep that mind cup as much as possible full of the things of God. So friend, what do you serve your mind every day? Who do you allow to serve your mind? Do you allow the devil and his spirits to continually come into your mind and sow seed in your mind of doubt and fear and deceit and thoughts of seduction and thoughts of temptation? Do you allow people to serve you weakness, unclean jokes, gossip, opinions, deceit, and other ungodliness? Or do you allow your mind to be yielded to the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, that He may serve your mind truth, that He may serve your mind comfort, that he may serve your mind his nine fruits, his nine spiritual fruits, that he may serve your mind the six things found in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of a good report, think on these things. Is your mind full of these things? What do you put into your own mind cup? The question is not only who do you allow to serve your mind, what do you serve your own mind? Do you serve your mind continually the promises of God when you come and you meet problems in life? Do you serve your mind songs and praises unto the Lord? Is your mind full of grumbling and complaining and dissatisfaction, or is your mind full of praises and honor and glory unto the Lord? Do you serve your mind God's blessings and benefits towards you? Remember what Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not His benefits. Do you ever keep God's benefits before you? The devil would love to make you forget them. It's your responsibility to keep them before you. Or do you serve your own mind that which is unedifying day by day? That which in turn will make you spiritually weaker and weaker. Now these thoughts that I speak of that are unedifying, that doesn't mean they're sinful. I'm not even talking necessarily just about sinful thoughts. Anything that does not pertain to the Lord, anything outside of divinity that you occupy your mind with continually makes you spiritually weaker. Whether you realize it or not, it doesn't have to be thinking and dwelling upon something bad. Whenever your mind is not upon the things of divinity, you are spiritually weaker for it. Why did Paul instruct his church to pray without ceasing? Yes, it's impossible to always pray, but you're always to keep that spirit of prayer. You're always to keep that mind connection to divinity. Pray without ceasing. That's just, all that's saying is talk to the Lord without ceasing. Is the Lord that real to you? Your friends, your coworkers, your loved ones are that real. You're subject to speak to them at any moment of any given day. Why can't the Lord be that real to you? Why is he only real to you when you gather in church? Why is he only real to you when you go into your prayer closet? He should be real to you 24-7. You should be able to talk to him and dart a prayer to him at any given point of the day with living reality. Let your mind be that full of divinity. Be diligent and careful to keep the things of God ever before you. Why? Because the devil knows that the only chance he has at your soul, child of God, which is sealed by the blood, and he can't get in, 
The only chance he has to get into your soul is through your mind. If the devil can contaminate a person's mind long enough with temptation, with mind battles, with otherworldly distractions, politics, things of this world, this, that, and the other, anything outside of divinity, if he can contaminate your mind with such long enough, he hopes to make you so spiritually weak that sooner or later down the road he can influence you. That when he does tempt you, you will take heed, you will be influenced, and you will decide to commit willful sin. By influencing your mind, the devil seeks to convince you one day to commit willful sin. And he will influence and he will influence with great patience as long as it takes to one day get into your soul. So protect your mind. How? You protect your mind with the Word of God. You protect your mind with the assistance of the Holy Ghost who is to live within you. And when temptations and the wrong thoughts come, turn from them and turn to divinity. For the Holy Spirit has the power to flush your mind. Listen to what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and and 25. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Then in Romans 8, verses 5 and 6, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Take note of that. If your mind is ever on fleshly things, and I don't mean, that doesn't mean just sex. That means Things of this world, if your mind is ever on fleshly things, things of this world, you're going to go after things of this world, fleshly things. But Paul wrote, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. If your mind is ever tuned in with the Spirit, you go after the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. If you're worldly minded, if you're fleshly minded, sooner or later it will lead to spiritual death in your soul. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To let the Holy Spirit have liberty in your mind, to be spiritually minded, that's life. That's eternal life and that's peace. So here the key is, the key to overcoming temptation is to be spiritually minded. To be spiritually minded all the time. That way this world, the devil, people can have no influence over you to make you spiritually weak and you deciding to one day commit sin. What is your mind made up of? What is your mind stayed upon? Carnal, fleshly things? Or spiritual things? The things of God. As the Spirit of God flushes your mind cup, you fill your mind with the Word of God, bringing every temptation, every thought under subjection to the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations. And that includes, you can, you can label this temptation, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In Psalm 119.11 it says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. The word just didn't stop here. The word went into the heart protecting him from sin. So when temptations and bad thoughts and bad imaginations come into your mind, do not let them roam free and take root within your mind. 
with your heart full of God's Word, flush out the imaginations that are contrary to the Word of God. Arrest and bring into captivity every thought that is contrary to Jesus' teachings. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves. How do you speak to yourself? In other words, this is another way of asking, what do you put into your own mind cup? How do you speak to yourself? Paul tells us how, speaking to yourselves in Psalms, the Word of God, and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Your mind is human and limited. It can only hold so much. So, the more you keep your mind full of God's Word, the more you keep your mind in tune with the Holy Spirit, the more protection you have for your mind. Because a mind that is full, a cup that is full, has no room for anything else. So the more you keep your mind full of truth, the more you yield to the Holy Spirit, the less opportunity the devil, the world, and people have to put their temptations and mind battles into your mind. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Then it says in 1 Corinthians 2.16, but we have the mind of Christ. Two churches were told by the Apostle Paul, we can have the mind of Christ. And indeed we can. We can because Jesus, as the Son of Man, he possessed a human fleshly mind like we do. However, he was diligent. He was very careful to keep his human mind full of divine ingredients, which gave Jesus the victory over all the evil temptations that came against him. And yes, Jesus was tempted, like as we are. And because Jesus was victorious in this life, a person who comes to Calvary can be victorious. Because divine blood makes a person born again. And by becoming born again, they are made an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. And that means everything Jesus as the Son of Man used to be victorious in this life is made available to us to use to be victorious in this life. Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. Through me you will have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, you will have tribulation, you will have persecution, you will have temptation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Child of God, you will be tested and tried. Temptations will come. But be of good cheer. Because as long as you walk in the footsteps of Jesus, you will be victorious. As he was victorious. Jesus came to earth not only to die for our sins, and redeem us through his blood, he came as our example. He came demonstrating victory over all sin and temptation. He came to show us how to live a victorious life on earth. As the Son of Man, he could have failed. He could have failed his heavenly Father, failed his divine mission. He could have failed. And Satan, he understood this. And that's why Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness to tempt Jesus' flesh. In Luke chapter 4, verse 2, speaking of Jesus, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. In this story in the wilderness, take note of what it says here, 40 days tempted. In this story, it highlights three temptations that the devil tempted Jesus with. But here it says he was tempted all 40 days. The Bible's probably not big enough to tell us all about the 40 days, full days of temptation. 
He was tempted for 40 days. Now, if Jesus could not sin or was unable to sin, if Jesus was beyond temptation, why would Satan come to him? Why would Satan waste his time? The devil recognized the weakness and vulnerability of his human flesh. And as long as Jesus lived in human flesh, the devil tempted him. The devil no doubt reasoned, the first man and woman were in flesh, made in perfection. I made them fail. I'll make the second Adam fail. Luke 4, 13. And when the devil had ended all, had ended all, his, all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. The devil was defeated, but he came back to tempt Jesus again. I want you to consider this as well when speaking of temptation. The devil is not the only tempter. The world people are not the only tempter. You must beware of self and selfish desires because self will seek to tempt you right out of God's will if you're not careful. Jesus said to his followers, if you're going to follow me in my footsteps, meaning doing the whole will of God without fail, overcoming every temptation, you got to deny self and take up your cross. And I'll give you an example in Jesus' own life of self being a tempter in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here Jesus was suffering greatly as he took upon himself all the sins and sicknesses of the human race. The Bible says he despised the shame of the cross. He wanted nothing to do. Not only did he know he was facing death, but he knew the type of death he would face on the cross, and his flesh hated it. The agony, the resistance, the trial, the temptation was so great within Jesus that the Bible says his flesh became as drops of blood. The intensity was so great. And just ever briefly, the flesh began to rise up, tempting him to fail. Matthew 26, 39, Jesus said, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Jesus knew there was no other way. Jesus knew that this bitter cup was his Father's will for him. It's the very reason he came to earth, born of a virgin, to die on the cross for the sins and sicknesses of humanity. Yet momentarily his flesh tried to interfere and back him out of God's will. But he quickly yielded to divinity within him. And he indeed drank that bitter cup his father gave him. And he went forth to fulfill the plan of redemption. In the second chapter of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul writes about Jesus and his relationship with the human race. Hebrews, 12, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, speaking of Jesus, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Jesus did not come to earth in a heavenly celestial body. He came to earth in human flesh, the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. As the Son of Man, Jesus lived victorious, over all sin and temptation, like unto us, his brethren. And today, because of his victory in this world, he is our high priest in heaven, who makes reconciliation to God for the sins of people. By using the divine blood he spilled at Calvary. Verse 18, For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them, that are tempted. Now, this word succor means to go to the aid of, to relieve. 
on earth. Jesus suffered temptation, but he overcame. And now today he is our high priest in heaven. Knowing our infirmities, he's able to come to our aid, to relieve us, to help us in our time of temptation, if we look to him. Then in Hebrews 4, beginning in verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Don't give in to temptation. Hold fast to your profession of faith. No matter what man, people, the devil, or self may do. Hold fast, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He is touched because he lived in this world before us but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted in every way imaginable, as he cloaked himself in human flesh, yet he was victorious over it all. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Friend, when temptations present themselves, do not let the devil deceive you and torment you, making you think because of this desire, because of this thought, you're guilty before God and you might as well act it out. No. Instead, immediately turn your mind to the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. Turn your mind to receive the grace and help and mercy that you need to be an overcomer like Jesus. Because your high priest will intercede for you. And he will provide you the strength that you need. And here, as I open this sermon today, I told you there is a promise in the word of God that promises you you will be tempted. But it also promises God's faithfulness and victory over that temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Temptation is common to man. It's common to everybody. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. God will not allow his children to endure temptation that they cannot overcome with his help. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Remember one of the definitions of temptation in the beginning? A test or a trial. God allows his children to be tempted, but only to a certain point. He will not allow the temptation to be stronger or last longer than what they can endure with his grace. Because at the right time, he will provide a way of escape that they may not fail God in sin. The Apostle Paul learned to rejoice in his tests, his trials and temptations, knowing that by God's grace, he had the power of Christ to overcome. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. Paul writing about the Lord's revelation. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Your weakness, that's where you're tempted, in your weakness. But God has strength for your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Think about a child of God, when you're tempted severely, tested severely, all you have to do is go to the Lord and the power of Christ will rest upon you. Therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities, in my reproaches, in my necessities, in my persecutions, in my distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. God allows temptations. He doesn't cause them, he allows them to happen. Why? that a person may demonstrate their love and devotion for the Lord. Temptations prove a person's measures of faith, divine faith, and puts to test the power of Christ that is to be in them. 
and work in them. As you remain steadfast in your time of temptation, God will always provide a way of escape, deliverance, and victory over temptation. Friend, listening to this sermon, know the difference between temptation and sin. Never let the, de the devil or man deceive you. They are not one and the same. The devil will try to convince you that indeed they are the same. To make you believe that if you are tempted with a bad thought or desire, you indeed are guilty and condemned before God. Therefore, you might as well just commit sin. Commit that sin. But Jesus said, the devil is the father of lies. And Jesus also said, know the truth and be free. And the truth is, temptation comes to all people in some form or fashion. The difference between a sinner and one who is victorious in the Lord, how will you respond when tested? How will you respond when tempted in your mind? Will you submit your heart and your actions to that temptation and sin against God? Or will you turn to truth and the spirit of truth, seeking to go before the throne of grace, seeking God's help in time of temptation. Friend, if you are a true sinner, if you have embraced the wrong things in your heart, if you have said the wrong things and put into action the wrong things, don't lose complete hope. There's hope through Jesus Christ. Because our high priest, Jesus, who makes intercession for children of God in their time of temptation, he will make intercession for you to God for the forgiveness of your sins, that the divine blood may wash them all away, that you may be made brand new to receive eternal life within your soul, that blood seal upon your soul. The Bible says if we confess our sin, God is just and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He's just and faithful because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary. Give your heart to the Lord right now. Pray this prayer with me. And everyone here today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Most of you here don't need to say it, but there may be one or a few who do. And you out there watching, pray this prayer with me. Let's all pray it for those who need to pray this prayer. Say, oh God, I confess all of my sin before you. I know you love me, Father, and I am coming home to serve you the rest of my life. And I believe there is power in the divine blood of Jesus that washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And amen. And friend, if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. You can receive healing now. Because when Jesus died on that cross, when that divine blood was shed, it was shed for the salvation of your soul, and it is shed for the healing of your body. And Jesus said a believer would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Friend, I'm the Lord's believer. There are many believers here gathered today in this auditorium, believing with you right now. And if two or more will agree and believe, touching heaven, it shall be done. So put your hand against mine on the screen if you're sick in body, if there's a great need in your life. You who have put in your prayer request in the comments section, do the same. Let's look to the Lord in agreement. And you in this audience today, if you have a great need, lift your hand before the Lord. Let the Lord move for you today. As you agree with others, God will move for you. Put that hand against mine now on the screen. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I bring the people before you now. God, lay a healing hand upon each one. In the holy blood name of Jesus, heal heal, heal, move for each person watching the live stream, move for each person in this auditorium today. God, bring deliverance and set them free for your honor, for your glory, 
in the holy blood name of Jesus. And amen. And friend, watch every sign of improvement and give God praise, honor, and glory. And let us know what God has done for you. And we will rejoice in the Lord with you. And if you who are in this auditorium, you're in need of prayer, let the usher know. And they will assist you in receiving prayer. And now I want everyone here to stand to your feet in the presence of the Lord. Friend, if you're in need of the Holy Ghost, it's time to receive. And this is the time in the service. I will call the anointing down upon you to receive the Holy Ghost. And friend, you're watching the live stream. If you're without the Holy Ghost, you can seek for him when I call this anointing down. Others have testified already that they've received the Holy Ghost during the live stream services at the end when the anointing's called down. They've received. You can too. Because just as salvation is a promise of God, a gift of God, so too is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost is for you who have salvation. So get ready to receive the Holy Ghost. Start praising the Lord with your whole heart and mind. Center your thoughts upon Jesus, glorifying Jesus. Let that mind cup fill up with praises and honor and glory to God. Let that mind cup be full and overflowing. And as those praises come forth, friend, the Holy Ghost will move in. And when the Holy Ghost moves in, that power will rest upon you. And as you continue to praise Him and glorify Him, the Holy Ghost will change those praises. And when he comes in, he will take over. And he will speak through you in another language. The initial evidence of the Holy Ghost baptism. Speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Now, friend, get ready to receive. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring the people before you now. In the blood name of Jesus, anoint them to receive ye the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. I call the anointing down. Oh, okay, pray, friend, praise the Lord. Glorifying Jesus now, lifting up praises unto heaven. Fill your mind cup with glory and praise unto the Lord, unto Jesus, your Savior, your healer, your deliverer. Let your mind cup fill up with Jesus, with Jesus, glorifying Jesus, praising Jesus. Oh, the Lord inhabits our praises. The Holy Ghost comes in on praises, praising the Lord. Worshiping the Lord, worshiping the Lord with the whole you today, glorifying Jesus, glorifying Jesus. Oh, we honor you, precious Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, glorifying Jesus, glorifying the Lord, glorifying Jesus. Let the Holy Ghost have his way. You who are here with the Holy Ghost, let him have his way. You who need the Holy Ghost, receive him. The Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Ghost move for you today in the blood name of Jesus. In the blood name of Jesus. In the blood name of Jesus. Let the Holy Ghost move, friend. Oh, the Holy Ghost wants to come in. He wants to come and feel his presence, feel his power, and open yourself up. Let the Holy Ghost have his way. Let the Holy Ghost have his way. We honor you, precious Jesus. We glorify you, Jesus. Praising the Lord. Praising him. Glorifying Jesus today. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm sick of love. I patiently await his return. For he's coming back. Bye. 